Hello all, this is Dr. Dan Maslach talking to you about reciprocity.com. The E is written with a three. And in this particular video, I want to talk about how to actually deal with idea theft in academic, academics and PhDs and scientists that steal other people's work. So if you don't know me, I am an associate professor of innovation strategy and entrepreneurship and part of this whole reciprocity project to give back. As much as I possibly can, there were so many people that helped me out that I want to pay the favor for it and help you out. So a follower asks, I'm a PhD student. I'm sick of people stealing my ideas. They pretend to be my friends and they asked about my ideas and copied it. How to deal with these people? Uh, okay. So um, first of all, if you, I'm not going to disclose who this is, but if this video helps you out, it's your responsibility. And anybody else that's watched this video, if you don't know the rules of this channel, uh, you have to go out and help somebody out. Um, it, you have to help out a random person and just be nice to them in the next hour. And it doesn't matter what it is. You can put comments in the video if you'd like. But if you don't feel comfortable doing that, just, um, you know, give me a thumbs up. All right. So, uh, you know, what I want to say is, you know, what I really want to disclose here is that everybody has their ideas stolen at one point. That's kind of... The point of academics is that you need to have other people that are borrowing your ideas. And so why does this sort of academic theft happen? Um, and the reason is, is that there is, or the feeling of academic theft, and I'm going to get into why that's sort of different. Um, it, there is a tremendous amount of uncertainty that happens in academia. So what is that? Um, uncertainty is just where you don't have information that's available and what you should do and what the expectations are um, that you should sort of do uh, or the other people should do. And this is kind of like normal real life stuff, right? Like this kind of stuff happens in real life as well, but it tends to be a little bit more explicit in academia. And some people take advantage of that uncertainty because they don't have boundaries that are as well set as you do, right? So you might have a very um, you know, very, very, very much a sort of boundary, like a, a, you know where it sort of lies. And then that other person that you're interacting with doesn't necessarily have that boundary, or maybe their boundary is sort of farther along the lines before they sort of recognize that, mm, you know, this is not sort of acceptable behavior. Okay. And so I think in terms of what is happening to you and to the rest of the people that are sort of having these experiences is that you're not necessarily upset with somebody taking your ideas. That is a component, right? That, that, that definitely does happen. But you're more upset with the violation of your boundaries that are happening. And you're more upset with that particular individual that they can possibly do that when you formed a relationship with them and that they can possibly, you know, that that is a real thing that they've done. And it is a reaction. So you're going to feel a lot of different reactions when this happens. Now, remember, I, you know, I guarantee everybody in academia, just like in the real world, has had these kind of incidents happening happen to them because we all have different boundaries, right? Um, and so what ends up happening is probably going to feel kind of um, anger, um, you know, sort of a, a, an awful feeling in your um, stomach, you might feel sort of betrayal, you might feel, um, you know, just plain old upset. There's lots of different emotions that you're going to sort of go through that. And it just means that your boundaries have been violated. Um, and, you know, two sort of major reasons that that might happen is that you just have not sort of explicitly told that person what those boundaries are. And that is normal, right? That's human interaction. You're not going to be sitting telling people having a contract that's well laid out when you know, what your boundaries are like that's kind of a silly thing to sort of assume that you're going to do that um and then the other thing is that you sort of let them uh you were giving signals in some sort of way that that was acceptable to do that kind of behavior and you have to sort of change that and give less signals to other people that that is acceptable behavior for you whatever those particular boundaries are and that's kind of a thing that you learn over time um, as human beings, as we sort of develop in this, this world that we have. Um, but I'm going to give you kind of, you know, my view on the sort of boundary issues that we have and the violation of boundary issues that we have, because we've all felt this, right? So if you have, and, and I think it's proportional in terms of what you sh your reaction to these emotions and what you should actually do is proportional to how much work you actually put into this particular thing that you've done, right? So if you've just simply had an idea 
and you haven't really worked through that idea that much, um, just take it as a form of flattery, right? So they probably have taken your idea and it's unfortunate that that happens and you just have a conversation with them. And, um, you know, they're not going to disclose that you had this conversation with them and, and all that kind of stuff. But just take it as a form of flattery when that actually happens, right? So that's an important thing to sort of think about is that they thought that idea was really good and you're a sharp person and they took and ran with it. And, you know, maybe they don't give you sort of credit for that. But that, you know, you haven't invested that much into that particular idea. So don't get all caught up into that. And I'm going to tell you why at the end of this in terms of why it's important to not get too caught up. Um, if you have a full-fledged paper and um, you're really working on something, it is it's an actual real paper and you've actually done the discovery and, and search and all that kind of stuff. You spent a significant amount of time on it. So I'm saying like, you know, four to four months to a year on the thing. Um, just be careful in terms of who you disclose that particular thing to. And now there's this like really weird Thing that you have to do right and so this is a battle that we face and this is pretty well known in open innovation literature that you in order to get people to sort of adopt your idea you have to disclose ideas and get other people to to sort of disclose it but then you also have to sort of hide components of it so that other people don't run run away with that so one way is to really just lean into it and be as open as possible and document that you're actually being as open as possible, right? So how do you do that? You have like different websites, right? So you can upload different documents to uh, ResearchGate, for example. You can upload documents to SSRN whenever it's just kind of like weekly done or put it on, you know, just kind of make sure it's documented in terms of the date and what you're working on. So other people, so that's where the violation is gonna happen is when you've had a personal conversation with somebody and then they ran with it and other people don't really recognize that that's your idea, right? So the problem is it takes a lot of work before you can actually put something up publicly before other people can't, before you'd feel comfortable with that. So you have to get to the point. And I think anything is, you know, in general, I hate to say this, but it's gonna be pretty fair game until you get to the point where you actually have an idea that's formed and written down. Um, and it's just because there's lots of sharing that happens. And I hate to say that, but that's really, you know, the reality of it. Until you get that idea down and written, it's really difficult to sort of pursue. They sort of have any sort of enforcement of that particular, you know, somebody violated that. So if the paper is really well developed and it is basically near um, being published, you know, it's um, conditionally accepted, really, really well done at a journal, you know, and it's stolen word for word. And I mean, like huge chunks of the thing, you know, a couple of pages, three or four pages, you might want to consult legal counsel at that moment, because it's going to be worthwhile to pursue that. So the problem is, in terms of pursuing legal counsel, it's really costly, and it is difficult to sort of pursue this thing, right? So you're going to spend a lot of time sort of going after somebody. And so that's the thing that you have to worry about. And that's the fourth point I want to point out with intellectual, this is all intellectual property issues. You know, this has well been, um, you know, it, it's not like, you'd be surprised in how sort of more research we can do in this area, but in terms of understanding, you know, these violations that happen in terms of intellectual property, it's been well sort of documented and understood in patent um, citations or patent literature, for example, this does happen on a regular basis. It's not, it's totally not uncommon. So if you're a lawyer type, you're going to be and you know specifying all the contracts and not disclosing anything and making sure that you know if you're more on the legal uh, legalistic sort of angle you really really nail things down before you disclose anything to anybody problem is that really slows down uh, innovation a lot and then it sort of slows down the diffusion of your ideas between other people and so you always have to make this kind of judgment call of when you should disclose and how much you should disclose and you know, in terms of the sort of pursuing of the litigation of something that's happening or sort of formal measures in a litigation could be, you know, legal counsel could be going and talking to your dean, for example, going and talking to the president of the university or the office person, whatever it is, um, not only just your legal counsel, like your own lawyer, but just getting sort of second opinion from somebody or a senior level um, professor that's there that's sort of dealt with these issues before. But ultimately, you have to know that there is a trade-off in terms of how much enforcement it is. Now, sometimes people, there are people that you need to sort of do this with in order to sort of expose them, right? So it's kind of like the Me Too movement, right? So there are some people that are constant violators with lots of different people. 
And the way that you sort of um, address it is you have to sort of expose them. So do a judgment call. You might want to get inside information with other people that have interacted with those people to sort of see what you should do in terms of how to address this particular thing. Um, so that is the, and I know it's kind of squishy and I, I, I'm sorry that I can't be a little bit more specific in this because it is a judgment call on your part in terms of how much is worth to you and how much effort you're going to go through sort of navigating this issue. So you could spend a tremendous amount of time doing the legal issue and spend not only time, but money, right? Going deep into these particular issues and really going after them. Um, and you probably are right. If you feel violated in some way, you probably, somebody probably did do something that was a little dicey, right? Um, and they might not know, but you know that it was sort of dicey and they shouldn't have done that. So the only thing that I can do um, suggest in terms of if that's happened to you as a certain individual or individuals, just don't disclose with them anymore. It's a violation of who you are and it's a violation of your ideas. And so you just know you can't really trust them as much going forward. And um, you just kind of like pull back the brakes, right? You're like, okay, I got to slow it down with this particular relationship. And it's just like with any other relationship that you might have to deal with. That's a real thing that happens. Um, and so the fifth thing I think is really important in terms of you going forward, in terms of ensuring that other people don't do this for you, it's really building your identity with the community, the academic community as a whole, that, um, you know, that, that, that other people know what your ideas are and who's actually driving the show. So you might actually see this in some sort of, um, you know, partnerships that happen, academic partnerships. There might be somebody that's actually driving the show, but because somebody has a little bit more prestige, if you're working with a professor, for example, and they, they have more prestige and you're just a PhD student, um, the, the professor might look like the one that they're actually doing that, right? But it's really your idea, really super crazy common for that stuff to happen. And so what you need to do in, in terms of academics, and I know it's a long run play, but everything in academics is a long run play being it's going to take you, you know, five, 10 years, 15 years before people start recognizing like, oh crap, that person actually was the person that was doing that kind of stuff. So what you need to do is develop a research pipeline that is unique to you. So, you know, sometimes doing a single author article, for example, or, you know, building your unique voice and having an identity rather than somebody else's identity that is reflecting on you. So everybody knows that, okay, this is yours and everybody knows what you're about. And so that's the important thing in terms of making sure that everybody knows that you are making that contribution. It's going to be really important when you go up for tenure, for example, it's going to be really important when you go for full professor or in terms of just the world viewing you so they know what you're about. And so it's part of the reason why I started doing these YouTube videos to sort of show other people um, that this whole reciprocity project is kind of an idea that I dreamt up and you know, you can document it. You can go back and look to see when the first time I actually started doing these YouTube videos as well as, by the way, go watch those ones, they're pretty terrible. Um, it really terrible. And so, but anyways, you can uh, you can also see when my website was put up and stuff like that. So you can see that I'm actually building this, right? Um, and that it is open to everybody. So that's all I want to talk about. Um, hopefully this answers your question. If it does, it helps you out. Go out and do something nice to somebody. Um, doesn't matter who it is. Just go do something nice to somebody. And, uh, you know, it's going it to be more for you, especially if you're dealing with these sort of negative emotions right now. It's going to really help you out. All right. Take care. And, uh, oh, give me a thumbs up. Do subscribe to the YouTube channel. I do appreciate it. Take care. Bye.